Hello, my name is Therese Scollard. I'm a registered dietitian. Today we're talking about functional assessment and the hand grip strength exam. We're going to talk about the background and orient to the exam as part one of a two part series on hand grip strength. So when talking about hand grip strength, why is a specific methodology critical for the application of the grip strength exam in clinical practice? And what is the statistical interpretation of the term measurably reduced as used in the 2012 Aspen Academy consensus? What is the statistical interpretation of the normal range of grip strength? And what about use of grip strength for sarcopenia? What we're talking about today is from the American Society of Hand Therapists clinical assessment recommendations. There is a method for the grip strength exam and it's really important to follow the method so that you and your colleagues can repeat results and get accurate information that's clinically useful. It's critical that all persons performing the exam adhere to the correct methodology in order to achieve these meaningful results. The recommended dynamometer is the Jamar Plus Digital or Dial Hand Dynamometer, dynamometer by Patterson Medical. And that is used because the people that have researched these have found that it's the most reliable and valid re for repeat testing. There are some other dynamometers that give um, reliable data. They've compared the, um, the JMAR to these other ones. So there are a few others, but they're not the um, ones you might buy off a website for just $30 or so. These are pieces of equipment that are very precisely managed and that will give you the best results. So grip strength is an indicator of muscle function and the dynamometer is the device used to, for quantitative assessment of hand muscle strength or grip strength. The name of the exam or the test is called the maximal grip strength test and it's the most feasible bedside method. It's a test of maximal force in pounds or kilograms. The force is measured that is applied to the hand when gripping. It reflects the maximum strength derived from the combined contraction of the extrinsic and intrinsic hand muscles. It's a sensitive measurement of short-term nutrition status, and it's inexpensive, portable, easy and reliable measure from trained persons. Why grip strength matters. Muscle function is an indicator of the functional ability and nutrition status of a person. It's a sensitive measurement of short-term nutrition status. Low values require further workup to determine diagnosis and underlying conditions so they can be remedied. The hand grip result is just one set of data in a comprehensive nutrition assessment. It is not an independent determinant of protein energy malnutrition, sarcopenia, frailty, or other diagnoses. Grip strength is a factor in clinical decision-making for the diagnosis of protein energy malnutrition, sarcopenia, and frailty. And one thing about grip strength is that it responds to feeding. Now muscle changes with aging. The muscle fibers are replaced with intramuscular fat and connective tissue. We experience as we age oxidative stress and degeneration of the neuromuscular junctions. And muscle metabolism shifts. There's this fiber type shift be, um, between type one and type two fibers that causes us to be weaker. Now there's influencing factors of hand grip in the well and the unwell. Age and gender affect grip strength in healthy individuals. So as you age, people typically get weaker unless after you're an adult. But in people who are not well, there's a lot of factors that influence grip strength, nutrition, disease severity, comorbidity load, uh, any medical treatments, immobilization, inflammation, uh, medications, um, oxygenation, and electrolyte imbalances. They can all impact grip strength. So you just have to know them. These are not showstoppers. You need to know what they are. Now, the Academy and Aspen consensus statement has indicators for malnutrition, as we all know. And you can see the list of, of the indicators in moderate and severe forms. And right here at the bottom is decreased, decreased grip strength. 
So that's a diminished functional status measure. And um, the grip strength dynamometer is really useful for that information. Now, like I said before, that's not going to be the only indicator of malnutrition. This is probably somewhat of a secondary indicator. And it's part, the grip strength is part of a whole nutrition assessment. So that's good to keep in mind. So in the Aspen Academy consensus, grip strength when patients are weaker is called measurably reduced. And what does that mean? And you can see on this chart that there is no comment about moderate malnutrition. It's not available. It's only the severe forms of malnutrition that we would be looking at. And the reason is there's just no data to differentiate a moderate grip strength from a severe. People are either within normal range or outside of the normal range. And typically, when we're looking at within and outside of normal ranges, the minus two to plus two is considered normal range for health metrics. And anything below, you know, minus two or above plus two is not normal. So you only have your client is either normal or not normal. And we differentiate that by the minus two standard deviations from the mean. Now, this is the normal grip strength table. This is an example for females and pounds. And I'll go through this because it's the same for males and also kilograms. So on the left-hand column, you have person's age. The next column where it says hand, you have right hand and left hand. And then you have the mean. So that's the mean uh, for that age and sex and hand in gr uh, gripping force. Now, these data are from a researcher named Matthewitz, who has done extensive work on this. And this, these charts go up to about age 76. I have a record from another famous researcher named Bohammon, and he has done some work for above age 76. So we have our age, our hand, the mean, and then you can see it slightly grayed out. I have one standard deviation. And how we got this chart is from the booklet that comes with the dynamometer. You can also look up the original literature on the, res the research. Anyway, so there's one standard deviation. And then if you multiply that times two, that gives you two standard deviations. So if you look at a 24-year-old right-handed female, the mean is 70.4 70 pounds. One standard deviation is 14.5 pounds and two is 29 pounds. So what I did on my chart was subtracted 29 from 70.4 and I got 41.4. And that's the point that's minus two SD from the mean. So if your patient, when they grip, that's the average of their right hand is 41.4 or weaker. They are outside the norm and you can say they are, their grip strength is measurably reduced. And that works the same for all of the charts. Um, I will encourage everybody to be really careful not to mix up the pounds and kilograms because it's really easy to do and can get uh, mixed up easily. So here's a male chart in pounds and we'll go through this again. So we have a 20 to 24 year old male. The right hand mean is 121 pounds. One standard deviation is 20.6. Two standard deviations is 41.2. I subtracted 41.2 from 121 and I got 79.8. So if the male patient of that age was uh, 79.8 on their, on their average or weaker, then that would be the alert level and you would say measurably reduced. So that's how that works. And it's very confusing on the chart that you get with the dynamometer because all of this is not computed for you. So that's why in the grip strength toolkit, which uh, DNS has on their website, um, I have created these charts so that you can interpret them much easier without error. So we have a definition of malnutrition, which I was just talking about the Aspen Academy consensus. And this is the World Health Organization uh, definition, a clinical syndrome. Malnutrition is a clinical syndrome that results from deficiencies or excesses of nutrient intake, imbalance of essential nutrients, or impaired nutrient use. We're moving into sarcopenia, so I wanted to provide a definition. This is from the European uh, Sarcopenia Working Group, um, a progressive and generalized skeletal muscle disorder associated with an increased likelihood of adverse outcomes, including falls, fractures, disability, and mortality. 
Now, several big groups have come up with operational definitions of sarcopenia, where meaning they have cut points and actual definitions for practice. Now, the FNIH is the foundation of the National Institute of Health, and it is the SD, SDOC2 is the Sarcopenia Definitions and Outcomes Consortium. And the two means it was the second one. Now in the um, DNS uh, toolkit, grip strength toolkit, what I have in that toolkit is from SDOC1. So it is not current anymore as far as the cut points and the criteria, but the, this is what I'm showing you today is SDOC2. And they used grip strength and gait speed in part to help clinicians decide who has sarcopenia. Now in Europe, they have done theirs and they approached it a little differently as a consensus, whereas the Foundation for the National Institute of Health actually looked at some more data. Anyway, they have compiled a structure that includes low, low muscle strength, low muscle quantity or quality, and low physical performance. And there's various tools recommended for these measurements and including grip strength for muscle strength. Um, and they also define acute sarcopenia as less than six months duration and chronic is greater than six months duration. Now the Asian working group has also been working hard on this and uh, they have more of a similar pattern to um, Europe than they do to the um, NIH. Now here's a chart that talks about all three of those groups. And um, so the Europeans, if you can look at the hand grip data, um, their cut point for males is 27 kilograms and 16 kilograms for women when we're just speaking of the grip strength. And you see they have other, other indicators, other criteria there also that we're not talking about today. Um, SDOC uses um, hand grip and gait speed. And the Asian working group uses those other three measures too, different techniques and their grip strength measures are different. So these people have, they have done uh, research on their populations and have done analysis and come up with these different ranges. And um, I think for us um, in practice, it's important to recognize um, the patient's actual measure. And when you document, you can say, according to this group, they're, they're low, according to this group, they're okay. You can discuss that in your, in your documentation. But the important thing is that you're measuring it and getting a, a structure that you can really help convey the clinical information to the team. Now, this um, chart I've drawn up is actually easier to view. It has the, all three of those groups, the hand grip strength, measurements for men and women in kilograms and what the cut points are. And you can convert those to pounds if you like. But you can see um, for the US uh, recommendations, men is less than 35.5 kilos and women is less than 20 kilos. And all the comment on the US is interesting. There also, because height affects grip strength, there is some um, mechanism to use the BMI. Um, and so you divide the grip strength by BMI and that will kind of balance out the uh, numbers. But I think for clinical practice, um, I think it, you don't need to do that. I, I, I mean, you can, it won't hurt anything, but I think just the, when you're looking at your patient and using your clinical judgment, you'll get enough information off the measurement itself. Now, uh, some interesting things about grip strength is the consistent, consistency in measurements can be affected by many things. For example, the posture, the time of day, the choice of the left or the right arm. The ASHT recommends both arms, not all methodologies do. Um, and also the handle position of the dynamometer. Um, that's why there are multiple handle positions on the dynamometers because some methodologies do use them. Um, but I think for us, I would recommend using the ASHT method, which only uh, recommends Pretty much one position. Now the grip strength is an indicator of upper limb strength only, although some literature does include it as a proxy for lower body strength. Um, it does not replace any evaluation of activities of daily living. It doesn't uh, replace the strength of the lower extremity measurements or walking speed, especially in fragile populations um, and or, uh, or with those patients with neuromuscular disease. Um, 
And then one thing that comes up a lot is hand dominance. And I'll just touch on that. Um, I did some research on this because the ASHT says it doesn't basically matter. And so different groups have come up with statements uh, such as hand dominance has no influence. Uh, correction for the effect of dominance may be considered, but it is not always appropriate due to variations in dominance across individuals. And if you think about it, um, how we use our arms and hands can vary a lot. If you're, an example I use is a mom holding a child in their left hand while they're, you know, doing activities with their right hand. Well, you know that that right dominant person would have a very strong left arm holding the baby in it for a long time. So they just conclude that it doesn't matter. And they recommend measuring both hands. And if you have a problem with a, a client where one of their arms isn't appropriate or something like that, you can use just one arm. But I think for the most part, the methodology recommends both arms. So now there are a few contraindications and barriers. Um, one is cognitive impairment or dementia. Um, it depends on the level of dementia. If the person can follow the instructions and adhere to them, then it's not a problem. But there's a broad range of dementia and or cognitive impairment. And so it would depend on the person. Uh, neuromuscular disease and impairment is probably one of the stronger ones not to use it because um, you're trying to measure nutrition. And um, if the person has a neuromuscular disease where their muscles or their nerves aren't you know, functioning right, you're probably not gonna measure the nutrition relationship. Um, and if they've had a, a CVA on the affected side, um, it kind of depends on how uh, long it's been. They may be fine on that side or just use the other side. Um, An arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis in the hands, if it causes pain, do not do it. And it depends on the arthritis. Some people um, are very painful and some people aren't. And so you wouldn't want to do it if there was a flare up, um, but it depends on the person. And then they would probably become their own normal also. So it depends on how active the disease is. Um, if gripping causes pain, then stop. Um, if somebody has an IV in their arm, I've tried to not use that arm. Um, sometimes patients have injuries or malformations of their hands, and they also could become their own norm that way. Um, and in ICU, I read people have done it in ICU, so it really depends on the patients. But some of the biggest things is incorrect technique or method and an uncalibrated or poor quality equipment. Those will not be good. They won't give you good, meaningful results. So I'd encourage you to consider your patient's condition and see what you think. But most patients can do it. I mean, even after surgery, you need to wait, probably tell the physicians, release the patient um, for this kind of thing. So anyway, so wrapping up, um, hand grip strength is for clinical practice. It is not only used in research. Um, I mean, it still is used in research, but it's not um, only use for research. In fact, um, Dr. Bohannon, who's a big researcher in this, I'm going to quote him from um, a publication called Clinical Interventions in Aging from 2019. And he said, the routine implementation of the measurement of grip strength can be recommended for older adults in the community and healthcare settings. So I was really happy to see that because um, sometimes people don't do this because they think it's just for research, and it's not. You factor it into your whole assessment, your comprehensive nutrition assessment, um, and you will find all kinds of interesting things about people, and your patients are very respect responsive to it. Um, they somehow, by measuring their strength, they will understand your nutrition messages, and it's a really great platform to educate. So you can use it in a lot of different areas. There is literature on, like I said, nutrition status, surgery, surgery outcomes, cancer treatment, eating disorders is a good spot, um, sarcopenia, frailty, dialysis, uh, pediatrics and adults. It's not just for adults. Um, geriatrics, it's very useful. Depression, cognition, uh, fractures, falls, um, there's a, and mortality. So there's a lot of literature on it. And my last slide is um, referring you to some resources. 
The Dietitians in Nutrition Support, DPG, has a much longer training program on it with resources and some of the documents I talked about. This is what we did today is just a brief overview. There is actually more to it. Um, and there's an article in Support Line from the spring of 2017 that has a lot of detail in it. So anyway, I think that's it. Thank you for your time. And I'll see you in part two. Mm -hmm.